coaches yesterday right. evening, those who came in last, uh, yesterday, frequently around 4 p.m. it starts to rain in Bangalore and things cool down, although there's a heat wave going around. So, uh, so uh, carry your umbrellas, it's my suggestion. Or, but the rains are warm rains here, unlike Europe, so it should be all right. Uh, and the last thing, so Wednesday is an off day, and especially for uh, the young students and postdocs who are from, uh, you know, outside Bangalore, go on to Wikipedia, Wiki Travels, Lonely Planet, whatever you can find, and try to figure out what you might like to do on Wednesday. Uh, there's also a nice hop-on, hop-off bus trip around Bangalore if you don't want to get too far from the city. Right, so uh, any more questions? Uh, I'm around, so you can sort of uh, badger me with this locally. Uh, about the TA, TA forms, I will update you as we go along where those forms are and how you fill them up. So, great pleasure having Alex for the first, book, uh, first lectures, and I'll request Emmanuel to introduce Alex and get the board rolling. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, it's the first time that the GDMG is held out of Europe. Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> and um, and so it's also the first time that we have a school before the meeting, and I think that's a very good thing. And uh, Alexander Chekoshin from Professor in Oxford has accepted to come and give the first lecture, which will be the introductory lecture on MHD. So you should not assume basic knowledge of MHD. If you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt him. And uh, at the end of this morning, you should be acquainted with uh, basics of MHD and be ready to learn on the applications. Alex, right. Well, thanks, Emmanuel, and um, thanks the organizers for uh, having us here. Um, so I have written this rather long URL uh, on top here, which is, um, which is a link to some lecture notes, these lecture notes, and uh, in fact, those of you who fall in love with MHD because or despite my lecturing, uh, can uh, can learn uh, more about it. So this was uh, this this was based on a um, ten lecture course uh, that actually just happened in Oxford in uh, uh, just a few weeks ago. So um, so so you know propitious timing. I was ready for this school. Um, uh, so the first. Uh, so the the first of uh, the three lectures that I am meant to give is uh, uh, indeed on MHD equations. So and uh, this is for those of you who have. Uh, uh, as Samridi has done, he tells me, have so far concentrated on the B equals to zero solutions uh, to the uh, to magneto uh, to, to magnetofluid dynamics. Um, so we'll talk about um, we'll talk about what happens, uh, how fluids flow when they're also conducting. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it probably is worth saying just a couple of words about what kind of fluids we're talking about. Uh, although pretty much nothing that I will say will depend on any particular properties of any particular fluids. Um, so, so, so for people like me, uh, who, you know, I'm not really actually a fluid dynamicist, I'm a plasma physicist. And so, for me, uh, a, uh, an MHD fluid is a or an MHD fluid is a particular limit of uh, uh, the more general situation, which is uh, which is an ionized gas, uh, nearly ideally conducting ionized gas that that is a plasma. Uh, and uh, uh, in that context, one could think about uh, magnetohydrodynamics. Uh, as a fluid limit of kinetic equations that describe uh, a plasma the same way that hydrodynamic equations are a fluid limit of the kinetic equations that describe a gas. I don't know, some of you might have come across uh, a kinetic description of uh, ideal gas. Who knows what's an, what an ideal gas is? 
or surely you know what an ideal gas is. Um, well, Mahendra knows what an ideal gas is. Um, Kanda doesn't seem to know what an ideal gas is. Uh, so <laughs> but that's, but he, that's, that must be because he, he has forgotten. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, uh, so, um, well, people usually have courses on ideal gas, and you, you, know, you, you deal with kinetics of particles, and then you uh, argue that if uh, these particles collide sufficiently often, uh, then, then they will flow as a fluid, effectively. Now, this is, and, and one can derive MHD equations uh, in that way. One can start by thinking of, uh, uh, of, of, of a plasma as a collection of particles, uh, and uh, uh, then, then simply look at the mean motions of this collection of particles. I am not going to do it this way. Uh, partly because it's a longer way, uh, and partly because there is a certain beauty in thinking about, about the flow of a fluid without thinking about what, it, what constitutes the fluid. Right? We're, what we really are going to be talking about is, is emotions of a continuous medium. And so we can even perhaps pretend to ourselves that we are 19th century physicists. Uh, and so we don't actually know anything about the corpuscular nature of, uh, of, of, of gases or, or liquids or whatever. Uh, and then we just know that, we, you, know, the, the, uh, you know, clearly we are surrounded by some continuous medium, right? I mean, you know, when these fans turn and we feel a little breeze and so on, we don't, we don't feel bombarded by individual particles, right? We feel that there is some, something continuous that's flowing around us. And the question is, how do we describe... Uh, how, do, how do we describe such a motion? Um, and in particular, how do we describe such a motion of a fluid that, uh, that can also conduct? So, so let's declare an interest in, in, in such a thing uh, and uh, um, ask ourselves how, you, you know, this, is, this sounds very vague. Yes, there is some medium that's flowing. Now, what does it even mean to describe it? Right? And, and how do we turn words into mathematics, as it were? Um, well, like always in uh, physics, or at least in modern physics, uh, the starting point for us in this description will be conservation laws. There is conservation laws that, that, that this medium uh, ought to satisfy. So, um, so, but that again perhaps sounds a little vague, because I haven't told you in what terms, in terms of what quantities, I'm going to be describing this fluid. So let's start, in fact, um, with, with a kind of a, not even the basic question, but it's kind of a pre-question, right? So if I'm going to have a, a description of a fluid, let's, let's ask ourselves, what, what does that mean, right? What do I actually want to know, right? What quantities do I want to know? Uh, and, and, and so I will, it's really dangerous to be next to this speaker, I can, I, I, there's, so, so I will try to turn back to it and, and speak at you. Right, uh, so, uh, so let's um, uh, ask ourselves what will be the mathematical description of, of this fluid in terms of what quantities will happen. Uh, well, for any, for clearly, uh, the, uh, a fluid, or a, indeed air, is very intuitively has mass, right? And so, and so it has a certain inertia, right? If I blow in that direction, right? There's clearly some flow that, 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 that by inertia gets transported some distance at least. Um, and uh, so uh, the, one of the key quantities will be the mass density of the fluid. So we'll be thinking of, of all these things as fields. So they will be functions of time and space. So at each point in space, we'll, we'll have some value of, of a mass density. Uh, there will be a flow velocity which I will call u vector. So not only, not only is a fluid, does a fluid have uh, density, uh, but it also flows. Uh, it'll have pressure. So all these things, I, I don't need to explain to you what they are because, because they're all intuitive in, in, in a way, and they all hopefully have connections to the things that you have studied. Uh, before, but uh, but it's a conducting fluid. So besides these three things, which would be enough for a 
hydrodynamic description, right? This is enough to, to talk about air or water or, or, or any of these non-conducting things. Um, well, now the fluid is conducting, so there must be ch conducting means means it allows it, it allows currents it allows currents to flow and charges to concentrate and so on. So um, so besides these things, we will also have a charge density. and the current density. So currents will flow, there will potentially be charges. Uh, and, the, and of course, at each point in our flow, we'll, we'll have an electric field. Uh, and uh, we'll have a magnetic field. Right? So, um, well, um, so our objective here uh, is going to be to find a set of closed equations which will describe the evolution of, of these quantities, these uh, six, seven quantities, uh, in time and at each point in space. Right? So, so basically, I can say that I have a description of a fluid if I can predict, given some initial situation and some boundary conditions, how, what all these things will be at every time and, and in every place. Anticipating needing more blackboard. Is there actually a way to erase anything? Oh, that is an eraser. Oh, I see. All right, okay, good. Um, right, so I promise to you that the way we're going to do this, the way we're going to figure out how these things evolve, uh, is, is via uh, saying something about conservation laws. Right? And so uh, the most basic conservation law that we can think about is the conservation of mass. Right? It's, it, it, it seems clear that you know, as air flows in this room, it doesn't suddenly disappear or appear uh, out of nowhere. Right? So, let's, so let's start with conservation of mass. Uh, which is um, which is the the simplest and the most standard of, of arguments in all of fluid dynamics uh, about how things evolve. So so this is the basic scheme for for how to use a conservation law for for establishing an evolution equation of something. So let's imagine that we have a fluid and uh, uh, let's 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 take a volume inside the fluid uh, and ask how much mass there is inside this, uh, this, this volume uh, as a function of time, right? Uh, and how this mass will change. Uh, well, uh, how it will change means what is the rate of its change, right? So uh, if I were to calculate the integral of the density rho of the fluid over this volume and uh, integrate over the volume and ask how that changes with time. Well, if the fluid didn't move, then it wouldn't change with time, right? So, so, so it would just stay there. Uh, but uh, because the fluid moves, remember I've delineated a certain volume, but the fluid is, is free to move in and out of this volume, right? So, and, and so there is a certain velocity field, uh, which tells me how fluid uh, is crossing the boundary of this volume, which is denoted dB, right? Uh, and so I can say, in order, to, in order to state the obvious, that the mass inside this volume is, is conserved, except for the mass that's taken out of, by the flow and taken in by the flow that's flowing in, uh, all I have to say is that the, ch the rate of change of the, of, of the mass inside, so this is mass in V, this rate of change uh, is... Uh, equal to the flux of the mass through the boundary of the volume. Okay? So this is flux out or in. There is a minus sign here uh, because usually by convention, and you've probably seen this in your undergraduate mathematics, usually by convention when, when I integrate over a surface, the, uh, uh, so the um, vector surface element, ds, points outward. Okay, so, uh, so this is a flux because this is density times velocity and then projected on the direction out 
of the volume, right? And so it tells me it tells me how much mass is crossing a unit distance, uh, sorry, a unit area on the uh, on the surface of the volume per unit time, right? So um, well, now uh, you know once we have this, then we can start doing mathematics, right? Because by Gauss theorem, this uh, so so if I use if I use Gauss theorem. Uh, by Gauss theorem, this um, uh, surface integral is going to be equal to the volume integral over the volume of the divergence of this, sorry, of this quantity rho u. Okay? Uh, and now there is a simple trick, uh, which is to say that um, since this is true, what I've just described, for absolutely any volume of volume V of the fluid that I might take, uh, and including the volumes that are infinitesimally small. Uh, so I could start shrinking this volume and make this all really, really small. So small that basically across, across the, the, this, this infinitesimal volume, the density doesn't change very much. Uh, and so I can convert this into a differential equation. Right? So this is uh, true for any volume. And so this becomes a differential equation, which is d rho by dt equals to minus divergence of rho u. So this is, uh, this is a very famous equation uh, called the continuity equation, which expresses the fact that the continuous medium is continuous. Right? So, um, uh, well, so this, uh, this is a simple argument, and, but the uh, um, use of this argument besides telling us the rate of change of, um, of density is to give us a method for determining the evolution of other quantities, right? Now, we do need evolution of other quantities because you can see that this equation is not closed, right? This equation tells you how rho changes as a function of time and space. It tells you that in terms of rho and u, the flow velocity, which you don't yet know, right? And so we need to know the u, the fluid velocity. How do we find out what the velocity does? Well, uh, as you might, well, let's see. What, what other conservation laws are there? Energy is good, all right. What else? Momentum, excellent. So, uh, so let's use conservation of momentum. We'll do, we'll do energy as well eventually, but let's do momentum first. So, um, so if I want conservation of momentum, uh, this is a similar approach, but things become slightly more complicated mathematically. So the approach is this. So let's take the same volume of fluid uh, and look at the rate of change inside that volume of the total momentum, right? So the total momentum is the integral over the volume of the momentum density, which is rho times u, right? So this is basically mv per unit volume, right? So, um, so this, is, this, is, this here is the momentum in v. Uh, and uh, again, Momentum, if, if, if nothing happened, if, if this was, if, 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 if nothing actually, if, if there was, if, if there were, there were no flows uh, and no forces and nothing else, then the momentum would be conserved inside there, right? So the non-conservation of momentum can be due to two things. Either it, it can be due to the fact that the fluid actually flows through the boundaries of the volume, right? And carries momentum with it. The way to do that is precisely analogous to this, you have to integrate over the, the boundary of the volume. What do you have to integrate? You have to integrate uh, something called the, uh, well, the momentum flux. Now, the moment flux of anything is basically the thing that you want the flux of times velocity at which it, it, it moves, right? And so it's, uh, it's the thing that it's a flux of, which is rho u, times the velocity at which it moves. Actually, if I wanted to be completely retentive about this, I want to write it like this. Rho u 
u dot ds. It doesn't matter for this expression, but I want to emphasize this because it's, this is the momentum rho u, this is the velocity at which it flows, and that velocity has to be projected onto the normal that's sticking out of the, of the volume. Okay? So the part of the flow that simply carries the momentum, or for that matter, the density, around along the boundary doesn't actually change anything inside the boundary. Right? So, uh, so, so this is, so this is the, the flow of momentum. So this is momentum flux. Um, well, but that's not the only thing that changes, that changes the, the, the momentum inside because, because fluid has pressure, right? And we have stuff inside the volume. And uh, you know that what's, what's pressure? Pressure is force on unit area, right? So the, the amount of momentum inside the volume will change if I exert pressure on it, right? How will it change? Well, let's just calculate the force Right? This, is, this is d by dt of momentum, so I have to calculate the force due to pressure. Right? Force is pressure times area. Right? And so it's an integral over the area of the volume, pressure times ds, and it's clearly directed against the normal that's sticking out of the, of the volume. Right? So, so, that, that's the, so there is this contribution, right? So this is, this is pressure. Pressure actually is not that different from momentum flux. It is also a momentum flux pressure. But it's those of you who have done kinetic theory know this, that pressure is actually the momentum flux associated with the internal motion of the particles, right? If, you, if, we, if, if we thought of it as, as, a, as a gas, one could actually explicitly write the pressure as a, uh, as, as a momentum flux associated with the random chaotic motion uh, of, of, of the particles inside the gas. Uh, well, you might say, well, why is this flux uh, a scalar, right? You know, why is this flux always in the direction of the uh, perpendicular to the, to the boundary? And the answer is it isn't. There, is, there are actually uh, more such fluxes. And uh, uh, that we will encode that fact in saying that there is also something called the viscous stress. So microscopically, the viscous stress is simply the, uh, the rest of the, the kind of the non-isotropic version of the, of the uh, flux of internal motion. But if you want to think about it in terms of 19th century physics, viscous stresses have to do with, the, with, with, with what happens if there are, uh, if, if there are sort of shearing motions around uh, around this volume, right? So imagine that if, if a fluid is moving like this along and the fluid inside is, move, is moving at, say, the fluid is moving here like this and there like that, there will be a shear stress in between and because the fluid has friction, that will produce force, right? So, um, and finally, you know, I've, I've ex explained all these forces, but let me, just in case I've forgotten anything, uh, let me also say that whatever body forces there are in the problem should also be part of this here, right? So, so this is, let's call this the body force, right? So F will be the force density. Uh, and this will, ex this will contain any other forces that might be acting uh, on the fluid. And I want specifically to think about the forces that, that are acting on the fluid in a distributed way. Uh, which in, that's why they're called body forces. So, uh, you know, one example might be gravity. Right, so, so, so clearly there is, there's, there's gravity acting on every piece of fluid, right? Or as we'll discover in a moment, electromagnetic forces will be in that, in that form as well. Well, okay, so, so this, is, uh, this is all the forces. And then again, I can use the Gauss theorem, just like I did for the, for the momentum equation. Uh, and so I can treat this uh, whole thing as a, uh, well, this, this, and this uh, are, this is a surface integral and so I can, convert this into a, a volume integral over a divergence of, of, of this whole thing, right? And so there will be a minus divergence rho u u uh, minus grad p, that's this, and minus divergence of the pressure, sorry, of the viscous stress. And finally, the body force, which was already volume integrated, right? 
So, um, again, because this is true for any volume I like, uh, this can be written in differential form, meaning that I basically can just lift the integration. Uh, and if I lift the integration, I get myself an equation for the evolution of the momentum density, which will be minus divergence rho u u minus grad p minus divergence of pi plus f. Uh, so now I can do a little bit of math to convert it into something uh, that is more conventional and more useful. So, uh, so let's do this derivative. This is u d rho by dt plus rho d u by dt. This thing here. Uh, and uh, I actually already know what d rho by dt is, right? It's this here, right? And so I can write this as rho du by dt uh, actually minus u divergence of rho u. Okay? So that's using this equation. Right? Uh, and I also want to unpack this expression here. Uh, this is going to be minus rho u dot grad u and minus u divergence of rho u and you can see why I have done it because I can now cancel this and this. All right? Uh, and so the result of this procedure is to get me an equation which just contains the derivative of the time derivative of velocity u let me join this term with that term, like that. And uh, here I have minus grad p minus viscous stress plus f. So this equation is the momentum equation for the, uh, uh, for the fluid. And the, those of you who have done fluid dynamics, has anybody done fluid dynamics here? Have you done fluid dynamics? Right, so quite a, few have, uh, quite a few of you have done fluid dynamics. So this stuff uh, is, the, is something that I will often call the uh, convective derivative uh, of u. It just tells you how velocity changes in the frame that's moving with the, with the velocity itself. So um, uh, now, so we have a momentum equation now with a force. Uh, and uh, I will say a few things about the viscous stress so that, so that you know, I'll say them and then I will never really need uh, the viscous stress ag again. So all this stuff that we've derived so far, which we, we, we have derived without making any assumptions about, about the nature of the fluid itself, right? So this, is, this has just been, well, I mean, we have made an assumption that, that fluid has mass and that, that mass doesn't appear from nowhere and so on. Uh, so, and that it has pressure, which we haven't yet calculated. Uh, and it, but, you know, you see that there are unknowns in this equation. Uh, and these unknowns are, well, fields that we still don't have equations for. And those are P, there is the force, which I will have to specify, and then there is the viscous stress. Now, to calculate the viscous stress, so typically it is possible to calculate the viscous stress in terms of the velocity itself. Uh, but in order to do that, you actually need to know something about the internal constitution of the, uh, of the fluid or gas involved. So, uh, in, so for that, you need kinetic theory. Uh, generally, so for gas, for example, for uh, ideal gas, you can show that this pressure tensor is minus uh, the density of the gas times uh, a quantity nu. That's called the Newtonian, uh, Newtonian kinematic viscosity. And then this all multiplies a something a rate of strain tensor associated with the fluid. Grad U plus grad U transposed minus two thirds divergence of U times the unit tensor. I will not need this in the future. I'm just I'm just pointing out to you that that typically, at least when things are sufficiently collisional, it is possible to write this in terms of the things that we already 
have encountered elsewhere for which we already have evolution equations, and those are rho and u, right? With pressure, we'll have to deal separately in a moment. So um, now I will be talking about, in a moment, I'll be talking about, about conducting fluids and magnetized fluids and fluids with magnetic fields. I should flag here for you a very important thing, which is that the viscous stress typically is not equal to that in a fluid that's sufficiently magnetized. So what happens is that when particles uh, move in magnetic fields, they, what tends to happen is that this uh, whole tensor, the viscous stress, becomes anisotropic with respect, to, with respect to the local direction of the magnetic field. It's a more complicated calculation. I won't do it here, uh, but I will say, for you to be able to look it up, so that in magnetized plasmas, Phi becomes something that's known as the Braginsky stress. And you can study this on your own. Look it up on the, on the web or somewhere. Um, so the idea being that viscosity in such plasmas is different depending on whether the uh, shear stresses are along or across the magnetic field. Right? Okay, well, this has, uh, you know, I must be boring you because you've all done uh, fluid dynamics, and uh, uh, so far I haven't actually said anything uh, new to you, right? This, is, this has all just been fluid dynamics. Uh, well, it, let's, let's uh, ask what happens when the fluid is conducting, and so we have these other fields to take care of. So, uh, so let me now talk about electromagnetic fields. And forces. Uh, now, um, so the idea is that so far in what I have de derived, uh, you know, where is where is the fact that the fluid is going to be conducting? Well, it's in there, right? It's it's in the fact that there are forces that can potentially be electromagnetic forces associated with the fact that charges there are charges in the fluid and they move. And of course, if you want to just like, well, with neutral fluids, the fact that things have mass mean, uh, means that you, can, that you can move those things by gravity, right? So gravitational field will, will, will move mass. The fact that there are charges uh, will mean that you can move things by electric field, right? And so there will be forces associated with that. Um, well, so for a single particle, you probably all know what happens to a charged particle in a field. What's the force on a particle, right? Well, there is a, there is a Lorentz force, or perhaps uh, in homage to our uh, chairman, I should say a Laplace force. Uh, so, so when you talk to Emmanuel, don't say Lorentz force, say Laplace force. Um, like most of such things, uh, was first discovered ex effectively experimentally, right? I mean, people just, you know, people just uh, looked at electric fields and currents and, and found that they're proportional and, and found that there is a constant of proportionality. And, you know, if you're an assiduous uh, experimentalist, you can, you know, once you've realized this, and once you've realized that this constant of proportionality is independent of particular circumstance, you know, particular uh, circumstances of your, of, of, of your system, you can tabulate what this is for any material, right? And issue a big volume uh, which all the future current and electric field engineers can use uh, for, for calculating this relation. Or indeed these days, you know, this, this volume can be turned into an app, right? And you could have a, you know, a resistivity app on your, on your smartphone and so each time which no, no, no doubt happens quite often in your life when you, when you know the electric field and need to know the current. You just use the app or, or, or vice versa. Uh, so, um, uh, so anyway, so there is this kind of app approach to physics where, where, where you can do this. Of course, this can also be calculated. You know, theoreticians are, you know, do have to earn their living. And, 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 so, and so once somebody comes up with a big table of values for some coefficient, there is, there is, there is always going to be a pack of hungry theoreticians uh, who uh, will ask, well, you know, this is a great opportunity for a theory, right? And so we can construct a theory of, uh, uh, of this. And indeed, theoreticians have constructed theory of resistivity. 
in particular in, in, in plasma. So in plasma, if you want to look up how to calculate resistivity, the term to Google is Spitzer resistivity. resistivity. So this theory was done by Lyman Spitzer in, in mid-20th mid century. Uh, Lyman Spitzer was the um, founder and first head of the American fusion program. Uh, so you can think of, of him as a, I don't know, Predemon core of, uh, of, <laughs> of the post-war years. Um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, um, so, uh, so this, is, um, uh, this, this, this is how to calculate electric field in terms of current. Um, we know the current. Uh, so the current in terms of the magnetic field, so it's A to C 4 pi curl B. And so, and so what should I do? Should I, just, should I just take this equation and substitute in here and I'm done? What do you think? Mahendra says nothing. Is this, is, is this what I should do? Because look, this is, it looks like there, there are the beginnings of a closed equation here, right? So eta is, sorry, E is equal to eta C over 4 pi curl B. I stick this in here, I'm done. Equation for the magnetic field. What do you think? Well, obviously, if I'm asking this question, the answer is there is a, there is a, there is a trick somewhere, right, that, that, that I have missed so far. Uh, well, the trick I have missed uh, is, uh, is that this electric field Right? If we're going to look at a moving fluid, right? so which electric field is it, you might ask. Right? Uh, so uh, I have a piece of fluid, and it moves with velocity u. This is a material relation about what happens locally in a fluid. Right? So this tells me that if I am inside this moving fluid element, and the electric field inside it is E, then I can relate it to current inside there, right? But I'd like to write my equations in the laboratory frame, right? I'd like to, 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 to look at what happens if I'm observing all this from some stationary, well, by definition, stationary laboratory position. Well, so I, that means that, let's call, let's call this E prime, the field in moving frame, so in uh, moving frame. So how do I relate the field in the moving frame, this is electricity and magnetism, to the field uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, to, to the field in the laboratory frame? Do you know how electric field transforms when you go to a system that, that moves with a velocity u? Who knows how it transforms? Yeah, exactly. So, so the electric field transforms like this. So electric field in the moving frame is the electric field in the lab frame. So this is moving. This is lab. And this is the velocity at which it's moving. And, and so it's this that's equal to eta j. OK? So um, well. This means that electric field in the lab frame is eta j minus u cross b over c. Um, this actually, there is, a, there is a nice physical meaning to this, uh, to this statement, which probably should be obvious at this point. Um, and, and it is this. Um, when we're so if, if the fluid had no resistivity at all, right, which, which means if the fluid was completely ideally conducting, right, uh, this would say that the electric field in the laboratory frame will always adjust to be such that the electric field in the moving frame is zero. Right? So if there are no currents flowing, basically the, the, the fluid 
well, or equivalently, I could say the velocity of the fluid will always adjust in such a way that the electric field in the moving frame of all the charges, of, of, all, the, of all the fluid elements, uh, is zero. It's, this is not such a surprising thing because, of, because, because if this didn't happen, right, if the electric field that the charges feel were not zero, then the charges would accelerate or decelerate until it was zero, right? And so, uh, and so what, what this says in the absence of resistivity, right, uh, is, that, is that the velocity in a fluid will always adjust to electric field and the magnetic field to make the electric field in the moving frame zero, or, vice, or you could say vice versa, electric field will adjust, right? So um, uh, you can, as, a, as an exercise in uh, uh, vector calculus, you can see whether you can prove that the, this velocity field is equal to E cross B over B squared. So the velocity field in a fluid uh, that's, uh, th that, that you need for this, this is, yeah. So the velocity field that you need for this, uh, which is technically speaking the perpendicular part of the velocity field, it's the part of the velocity field that's perpendicular to the magnetic field, it's always perpendicular to the electric field, equal to E cross B over B squared. Those of you who have studied the motion of charges uh, in, uh, um, uh, in magnetic fields know that, that the charge subject to an electric field and a magnetic field will drift across both at a velocity equal to, e, at, at something called the E cross B velocity. Have you come across that? So that's another. In MHD, this is kind of, this is sort of hidden in the fluid equations and so on that this is the case. Uh, but, but, but it is true that, that MHD motions, the motions that are perpendicular to the magnetic field, are simply E cross B drifts of, uh, of charges. So look up charged particles in E and B fields, and in particular, what is an E cross B drift? So I won't teach this here because we won't need it for uh, hydrodynamics, uh, sorry, for magnetohydrodynamics, but, but, it, but it's worth understanding these things. Uh, so, um, right, so let's take this electric field and put it in there. What do we get? We get dB by dt equals to curl of U cross B. So this is this term substituted in there. Uh, and then uh, minus c squared eta over 4 pi curl, curl b, like this. So this is, the, I, I used the Ampere's law for, uh, for j, so I used, I used this. And uh, um, finally, and maybe I should write this equation on that side of the board because we'll study this equation quite a lot. If I, if I unpack this double vector product, what I'm going to get is dB by dt equals to like that. And then this double vector product will simply turn out to be a Laplacian of the magnetic field. I'll leave this to you as, a, uh, as an exercise. I have cheated a little bit. This eta is actually something that used to be called c squared eta over 4 pi. I have changed notation and, uh, uh, because I don't want to, care, to carry c squared over 4 pi. So this coefficient c squared eta over 4 pi in front of a, of a Laplacian is called the magnetic diffusivity. Uh, now, you can probably see why it's called the magnetic diffusivity because it turned out that this, this part of the induction equation that came from, the, from Ohm's law, from the current, right, uh, simply has a diffusion term here. And so this part of the equation is simply diffusing the magnetic field with a diffusion coefficient that's equal to eta. So it's magnetic diffusivity. But uh, it's, um, uh, I'm going to be sloppy and some, some, sometimes call it resistivity because people, people very often 
still refer to this quantity as resistivity. So technically, resistivity is what I previously called eta, and magnetic diffusivity is c squared eta over 4 pi. Okay? It has different dimensions, so pay attention. Right. Uh, so, this is, so this, then, is the evolution equation for the magnetic field, which tells you what the effect is of the flow on the field. All right? So this is, this is the key moment. We've, 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 dis, we've now described the magnetic field in terms of the velocity field. So we've closed that part of the momentum equation. Right? Remember, the momentum equation had a force that depended on B. Now I know how B depends on U. Right? So, that's, so that's quite useful. So um, uh, this equation is called the induction equation. And it's due to Hertz, the same Hertz to whom the, uh, you know, after whom we call frequency units, right? So, um, all right, so let's now, oh, uh, and one, one other thing, you might, you might ask me, well, but, you know, is this, is this consistent with the statement that uh, magnetic fields should have zero divergence at all times, right? Because that, that, of course, is clearly non-negotiable. So, as an exercise, uh, you can prove to yourself from this equation that the divergence of the magnetic field is indeed zero if it is zero at the beginning. So you can try and prove that the solutions... Uh, yeah. Is that right? I, they usually call it Hertz equation. Um, I'm maybe, you know... Perhaps Alphane was part of it as well there somewhere. Hertz was before Alphane though, wasn't it? Right. It's induction equations are usually created to Hertz. Uh, so, so let's now, uh, let's talk then about um, the, the, you know, the meaning of this equation and, and what uh, we learn about, about the magnetic field evolution from, from this equation. And you'll see that this is, in a way, right, I've, I fulfilled the key part of my brief uh, for these lectures, right? Because, because in order for you to be able to do dynamo theory, uh, you, uh, you know, primarily need to know this equation, right? The dynamo theory is very much about properties of the solutions to this equation if you somehow know the velocity field, okay? So, um, uh, so in this context, I want to introduce, in the context of, of, of talking about uh, the uh, properties of this equation, I want to introduce a very important concept known as the magnetic Reynolds number. So, um, now, what this equation tells you is that magnetic field will evolve due to two things. It will evolve due to flow, and it will evolve due to the fact that it diffuses. Right? So this, this is diffusion, this is flow doing something to the field, and I'll discuss shortly what that something is. Um, so uh, let's compare the um, sizes of these two terms. So what's the size of that? So how big is this compared to that? Well, I'll use my, this, this, the same thing that I had before. This is U over L times B same scheme, uh, eta over L squared times B, B cancels, and so this becomes UL over eta. This is a dimensionless number, and this number is usually referred to as the magnetic Reynolds number, and denoted RM. Okay? So, uh, now, this says that if the magnetic, so the magnetic Reynolds number is the typical size of the velocity field times the typical scale of that velocity field divided by the magnetic diffusivity of the conducting fluid. All right? Uh, and uh, if, if the Reynolds number is large, then the, if, then the effect on the, the evolution of the magnetic field will be primarily due to flow. 
And if the magnetic uh, Reynolds number is small, it's vice versa. If the magnetic field, uh, sorry, if magnetic Reynolds number is small, then primarily what we'll just have is magnetic field diffusing, right? And that's a very simple equation and not very interesting one. So clearly all the interesting things will come from here, right? So we are uh, uh, going to be interested in cases uh, primarily, although not always, uh, where the magnetic field, uh, where the magnetic Reynolds number is large. So if this is large, so this is kind of a flow-dominated magnetic field evolution. Magnetic field evolution. Um, so when uh, people often decide that, when, that, that if this is true, then they can simply set resistivity to zero, Right? And when you do that and solve the equation without this term, this is something that's usually called ideal MHD. You have to be, I mean, we'll, we'll derive quite a few results uh, for the ideal MHD, uh, but you have to be quite wary of it. You should generally be wary of things that are called ideal anything, right? Uh, uh, because uh, what that usually means is they don't exist. Uh, so, um, uh, it turns out that actually uh, when magnetic field evolves due to a flow, uh, more often than not, it will develop very large gradients. And once it develops very large gradients, this term comes back because this, is a, this may, might be a small coefficient, but it, it's multiplying a Laplacian. And so if something has a very large gradient, this term can become very large. And so in dynamo theory is all about the interplay between these two terms, all right? So um, uh, anyway, so I think we are probably about to have a break, right? Is this, is this, is this, is this correct? So, uh, so let's have a break, and after the break, I'll come back and talk about how uh, magnetic field evolves uh, due, due to the flow and the... Uh, uh, what, therefore, we're talking about when we're talking about dynamo. All right. Does anybody have any questions, perhaps? Let's, let's, let's spend a couple of minutes on that. Yeah? Can they prove analytically about the similarity of the ideal Sorry? Can they prove analytically about the similarity of the ideal Well, there will be. Uh, we, oh, you mean is there an analytic proof yeah. that there will be singularities? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yes. If effectively, yes. It's, well, or, so I don't know what the status of the induction... I mean, it's pretty obvious that there will be singularities. So it must be true. Whether this obvious has been converted into an actual mathematical theorem, uh, I don't know. I, I suspect it has been. There is, a, there is a book on that. Not just on that, but there is a, there is a, there is a sort of a book that, that contains a sort of a compendium, compendium of mathematics results to do with dynamo, it's by Arnold, uh, called, I can't remember what, uh, uh, God. It's, uh, so, so the book is, is, is uh, it's, it's called something like Topology of Fluid Flow or something like that, and there is a, there is a long chapter there about, about dynamo with, with, with a collection of results on this. But it's pretty obvious that there will be singularities, and in fact, I'll show that in, in, in my next lecture, that, that there, there will be large gradients. Um, any other questions? Well, maybe then we should uh, talk offline while, what are we going to be doing, drinking coffee? Are we, we going to be drinking coffee or what? Yeah. Yeah, so let's, let's go drink the coffee and talk about... <laughs>